My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. When people hear the word vampire, they usually start thinking about Transylvania and Dracula. But vampires existed in folklore well before Bram Stoker wrote his tale. In fact, vampires have existed in lore of many different cultures around the world throughout the ages. Today, most people think that vampires are just a character in a movie or a book, but that isn't true. Even in current times, tales are still told about vampires that are said to be actively hunting their prey. So get ready, my spooky friends. You are about to hear the tale of the vampire at Gibson Cemetery and some of his terrifying brethren. Prior to the 20th century, no one thought of vampires as romantic leading men who sparkle while looking for their forever love. In fact, the vampires of lore were not hot at all, but were considered to be terrifying and demonic in appearance. For example, many vampires of old were bald and twisted with sharp jagged teeth who stalked their victims in their sleep. They didn't just feed on humans, but also on animals, both wild and domestic. According to the book called Encyclopedia of the End, Mysterious Death in Fact, Fancy, Folklore, and More by Deborah Noines, vampires ate the flesh of the dead and spread pestilence and disease. The lore of today was born out of old world superstition. Historically, people believed that vampires possessed the power to bring misfortune and illness to a community by passing on their curse. It was believed that people became a vampire when bitten by another, and the curse of being undead was passed from one to another, just like we do pass a cold today. In most cases, a vampire would return to the grave after appropriate measures were taken to ensure that this creature died for a second time. Historically, any part of a person's death or interment that seems odd could make them the subject of either ghost or vampire cemetery lore. Vampire tales are still a very popular topic in modern cemetery lore. Now, even though today we understand that infectious diseases are spread directly by person to person or indirectly by a person coming in contact with a contaminated environmental source, people still fear the worst case scenario of getting an illness, death. This itself helps keep the tales of vampires alive in our modern times. Many of these stories start with an individual passing in a way that was not considered to be natural. For example, murder and suicide victims, those who fell in an epidemic, and those who died within disasters were all prone to become the subject of vampiric lore. In addition, anything that hindered a proper vigil over a corpse or violated the idea of a respectable death was also a possible starting point for becoming a vampire. In fact, holding a vigil over someone who passed was a custom that originated to ensure that that person was really dead. Once the living was certain that their loved one was dead, for sure, the body was then interred for internal rest. But as you all know, not everyone dies a gentle death. Not everyone is able to have or wants to have traditional death rites performed. As a result, we have some very interesting vampire lore that is still told today, and our first tale is actually connected to a real-life disaster. When train tunnels started to be built, this changed the railroad industry. Instead of having to go around massive obstacles like a mountain, trains could now go directly from one side to another, allowing for more efficient travel. But in the story you're about to hear, train tunnels in the U.S. state of Virginia are now linked to the tale of a vampire. According to the most popular versions of this story, 80-year-old William Wortham Poole passed away sometime in the year of 1922. He was laid to rest in his family's mausoleum at the Hollywood Cemetery located in Richmond. By 1925, Tales started to be told that William was not actually at rest, since he was a vampire. So what does any of this have to do with train tunnels? In 1925, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway started to envision them creating what they would call the Churchill Tunnel. This would be an efficient way for trains to move through the mountainous area alongside the James River and provide them with more profit. 
the tunnel would allow for trains to travel 4,000 feet or 1,219.2 meters under the Churchill District of Richmond. This tunnel was doomed before it was even started. The soil was mostly clay, which retains water, and these damp conditions made the tunnel structurally unsound. Now, safety issues started during construction, and this continued even after the tunnel was completed in 1875. These conditions were no secret. In fact, the people in this area started to call the Churchill Tunnel the Tunnel of Death due to this. By the year of 1900, Chesapeake and Ohio Railway decided that these safety issues were making this tunnel way too expensive to keep open, so they decommissioned it. The tunnel was left abandoned for the next two decades before the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway Company decided to reuse that tunnel. They planned to use it to help expand their rail line, and they started construction to widen it and make repairs after years of neglect. Part of this was creating ditches beneath the existing brick walls to accommodate larger freight cars. But the walls did not have proper bracing and could not support the approximately 70 feet or 21.3 meters of clay-based soil that was on top of them. On the afternoon of October 2, 1925, over 150 feet or 45.7 meters of the western end of the tunnel suddenly collapsed, with fissures as deep as 30 feet or 9.1 meters developing in the ground above the collapsed portion. Within the tunnel itself, a work train with one locomotive and 10 flat cars were trapped. The engineer of this train was killed, along with several workmen. The engineer's body was recovered after nine days of digging, but the others were not so lucky. Efforts to recover them were abandoned as the clay roof continued to collapse. In time, the railway added support to the portion of the tunnel that had not collapsed by installing cribs of railroad tides, and then they filled the tunnel with sand. They then sealed each end with concrete, creating in essence a very large tomb. It was during this disaster that the tale of the Richmond Vampire begins. Those who survived this collapse had to crawl eastward underneath the trapped train to try to escape. As the survivors crawled out to freedom, some claimed to have seen a male figure drenched in blood walk out of the tunnel. Now, considering what just happened, my spooky friends, this makes a lot of sense. That is, until you hear the rest. As the man got closer to witnesses, they saw that he had a wild look in his eyes, had sharp, jagged teeth, and his flesh hung from his bones. He walked up to one of the wounded men who escaped the tunnel and bit him aggressively on the neck. When witnesses ran up to demand what he was doing, this man ran down the railroad tracks towards the Hollywood Cemetery. The witnesses took chase, but they were unable to catch him as he disappeared into the mausoleum of William Wortham Poole. As the group got to William's resting place, they were shocked to discover that the doors to the mausoleum was sealed. It seemed like he passed right through the doors like they didn't even exist, and no one saw the blood-drenched creature exit the tomb. In one variation of this story, William was actually a vampire who came from England, who used this area as his hunting ground after his alleged death. Many historians believe that this tale started due to the date on his mausoleum states 1913, even though William died in 1922. People claim that William's first death was in 1913 and his second came in 1922. But the truth is that William's wife died before him in 1913, and the date in question is actually the year of her death. One of the most popular theories out there is that the blood-drinking entity that came out of the tunnel that day was not William at all, but of a man named Benjamin Mosby. Benjamin was a fireman, and he was shoveling coal into the train when the tunnel ceiling started to collapse. He was said to have suffered severe burns when the rubble fell, which caused the train's boiler to explode. Severely burned and in intense pain, Benjamin was able to crawl underneath the train with his co-workers towards the eastern entrance to escape. After he got out, those who helped him described his physical condition as being mangled from his severe burns and his injuries. They also said that he was very disoriented, and this is why many claimed that it was actually he that people saw that day. But due to his injuries, it's highly unlikely that he was able to run the distance that the vampire did to get to the cemetery. 
Many historical references tell that after this disaster, he was brought to the hospital and he died there shortly afterwards. The Churchill Tunnel never reopened after this disaster, and the mangled wreckage of this ill-fated train still lies underground in the rubble. And as for the Vampire of Hollywood Cemetery, he was never seen again after that day. His legend still continues, and due to this, occult activity is regularly reported near the entrance of William's Mausoleum. If you choose to visit this location, please be respectful to all of those who lie there alongside William and his wife, who include several American presidents. Whether you're a vampire hunter, a history buff, or just love cemeteries, this place is definitely worth a visit. The next vampire we're going to talk about lives in Gibson Cemetery, which is located in Park Hills, Missouri, in the United States. This property was originally owned by Greenberry Gibson, who sold it to his son William. It is believed by their descendants that both Greenberry and William are buried there in unmarked graves, and I am sure that both of them would be saddened by the neglected state their resting place is in today. This cemetery has been targeted for damage for years, and because of this, only a few grave markers of the over 300 people buried there remain today. There are interesting stories about some of the people who lay at rest there, like Joseph Dalton, who passed away in 1917 after he was hit by a bread truck, and of John Lawless, who was accidentally shot in 1909 at the age of seven. But the most popular story is concerning who has been nicknamed the Elvin's Vampire. The most commonly told legend is that during the early 1900s, a man moved to the nearby town of Elvin's. He was a Hungarian miner, and allegedly, he never left his home during the daytime. He was said to be a very dark and cruel man, and not long after he arrived in town, the children of the area started to die. Now, according to the locals at the time, this had nothing to do with the various pandemics that were in the area, like the Spanish flu, typhoid, and tuberculosis. It was the fault of this miner, who was actually a vampire. Now, interestingly, it is said that this vampire was an albino. His skin was deathly pale, his hair was bright white, and he had bright red eyes. Those who suffer from this hereditary condition produce little to no melanin, which determines the color of your skin, hair, and eyes. They can suffer from vision problems and are very sensitive to the effects of the sun, which in part can explain why people may have said that this person was a vampire. It also could explain his profession. A miner works in limited light, which for this individual, it would have limited his light sensitivity. But that's not how the locals saw things. When this man passed away, people didn't want him buried near anyone else, especially children. His grave was placed on the edge of the cemetery, surrounded with a wrought iron fence. Crosses were hung on the fence in order to keep the vampire from roaming around the cemetery and to keep him at rest. But it seems that due to his disability, as well as the anti-immigrant settlement that was in the area at this time, this is why this miner became part of local folklore. The city of Lafayette, Colorado has been named as one of the 50 best places to live in the United States and as one of the best cities in its state. But many people think differently when they hear that Lafayette has its own vampire. In the pauper section of the Lafayette Municipal Cemetery, there is a concrete headstone that has a tree growing through the middle of it. This headstone marks the final resting place of Theodore Glava and John Trandafir. The two men were not related, nor were they partners in life. They were both immigrant paupers who were buried together due to their economic circumstances and because they both died in 1918. John died in his late 20s from pneumonia, and Theodore, he died in his early 40s from the Spanish flu. John was from Austria, while Theodore was from Transylvania, but due to their headstone having an inscription error, many believed that it was actually John that was from Transylvania. So, what does this have to do with our story? 
Well, as you guys likely know, Bram Stoker's Tale of Dracula takes place in Transylvania, and since this book came out in the late 1800s, this caused many people at the time to believe that Transylvania was ground zero for vampires. Now, concerning Theodore, many say that he actually looked like Dracula, but John did not. It is said that he was a tall, slender man who had dark hair and unusually long fingernails. Now, my spooky friends, it is very possible that through time, local lore has attributed the wrong physical characteristics to the wrong person. The only thing that we can say for sure is that stories of paranormal activity has long been associated with this gravesite, and according to some, Theodore cannot rest due to the mix-up on his headstone. Theodore moved to the town of Lafayette to work at the Simpson Coal Mines. When the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 overtook the town, Theodore was one of many who were sick. The entire town went into quarantine as the flu hit household after household. According to Theodore's obituary, it says that after he got sick with the flu, he felt that he was healthy enough on December 3, 1918 to go into town. The following day, he relapsed and he passed away. He was buried on December 6, 1918 in the pauper section of the Lafayette Municipal Cemetery. According to the most popular version of this tale, shortly after Theodore's death, the town was plagued with unexplained deaths. Animals and people were being found completely drained of blood, and the townsfolk quickly came to believe that a vampire was stalking their town. Because of the transcription error on his grave, the townspeople came to the conclusion that Theodore was the guilty vampire. Why? Well, it was because he was from Transylvania, and as we said, during these times, people believed that this was Vampire Central. So, they decided to stop Theodore's rampage. They disinterred his body, drove a stake through his heart, and, according to lore, Theodore's reign of terror was instantly stopped. But soon after this ritual was completed, a tree sprouted up in the middle of Theodore's grave. It was believed that this came from the wooden stake that was driven through his heart. But then something else occurred. Many believed that Theodore tried to claw his way out of his grave. So in response, thorn-filled rose bushes grew out of his fingernails and that stopped him from rising. But our story doesn't end there, my spooky friends. Allegedly since his death, Many have witnessed Theodore's spirit sitting on top of his grave, and he'll push anyone off if they try to do the same. He is said to materialize as a tall, dark-haired man with extremely long fingernails, and is dressed in a long black coat. People report hearing disembodied voices and seeing orbs and mysterious glowing lights near his grave. Today, people leave gifts for Theodore in hopes to prevent him from either haunting them or hunting them. But I can't help but wonder if this tale would even exist today if the word Transylvania was written under the right name on his gravestone. Mineral Point is a small city located in Iowa County in Wisconsin. It was settled in 1827, and in the beginning, it was known as a lead and zinc mining town. Today, it's a tourist attraction due to its local art scene, its preserved historical look, and its amazing outdoor activities. What many of the tourists today don't know is that this location is said to be the home of a vampire. The tale of the Graceland Cemetery Vampire begins on the evening of March 14, 1981. This is when the local police started receiving calls about a tall, dark-caped figure walking around the headstones in Graceland Cemetery. A police officer went to the site to check things out, and he reportedly saw the creature. As soon as it became aware that the officer was looking at him, he ran away through the cemetery at superhuman speed. The officer chased this creature and wasn't able to catch up to it. It ran towards a six-foot-high fence that surrounded the cemetery, and then he just glided soundlessly over it. The following day, the officer returned to the cemetery to try to track whomever he saw the previous night by looking for prints in the snow on the ground, but all he found was undisturbed snow. When this information became public, rumors started to fly around that a vampire was now on the prowl. Since this day, police still get reports of this alleged vampire. He has been seen multiple times in the cemetery and was also seen lurking in a tree outside a nearby apartment building. There have been reports of this vampire stalking various people, with one incident being that he stalked a couple who were fishing on a nearby pier. 
But here's the thing about this tale, my spooky friends. Just because it may sound credible since the first sighting was by a police officer, it doesn't mean it is. Those who knew the officer in question, Officer John Pepper, claimed that he was a jokester. He was well known for his practical jokes and would regularly walk around town wearing a gorilla suit and scaring people. Most believe that if Officer Pepper loved scaring people with a gorilla suit, it was highly likely that he was the vampire of Graceland Cemetery. But the thing is, my spooky friends, Officer Pepper moved away from the area in 1987 and sightings of the vampire occurred after he left. So the mystery of who or what this creature is still remains today. Our next vampire lives in the Erie Cemetery located in Erie, Pennsylvania in the United States. Those who visit this cemetery claim that when they approach the mausoleum of the Brown family, they get a very unsettled feeling. This is because many believe that this is the location of a vampire. Many of the names of those who rest within the mausoleum are now lost to time, but what we do know is that many of those inside are members of the Goodrich family. Gertrude Goodrich Brown, who is now deceased, is said to be the owner of this vault. When she first had the vault constructed, she did so to have her family lie together in eternity. I am sure that Gertrude never would have imagined that this vault would become a place of legend. Nobody knows which family member is the vampire who lives at this location, but it is said that it could be one of over half a dozen who lay at rest there. It can't be Gertrude, though, since she decided to be interred about an hour away at another location. Most stories tell that the suspected vampire died of tuberculosis, but there is no proof that those who are in this mausoleum died of that disease. To make this tale even more confusing, no one even knows for sure if the vampire is male or female. Experts do believe that the tale you're about to hear came about due to another alleged vampire that you heard about in previous episodes. Mercy Brown, a.k.a. the Rhode Island Vampire. Folklorists believe that due to Gertrude's married last name was Brown, the two were linked together in death. So, what is the tale concerning this vault? According to local lore, after a member of the Goodrich family died of tuberculosis, the locals started being found dead, drained of their blood. They all had puncture wounds on their necks. It was the cemetery's groundskeeper that realized that the guilty vampire must have been one of the seven family members interred in the Brown Mausoleum. So in attempts to save the town from another vampire attack, this groundskeeper sealed the vault. But the townsfolk didn't think that this would be enough. So they decided to torch the stone vault, which turned it black and burned off the epitaphs of those inside. The townspeople thought that this was a very small price to pay to save their town. Today, it is said that those who try to investigate this vault will die prematurely. One tale tells about a man who decided to fall through with a dare and climb on top this crypt's roof. When he got to the top, the vampire suddenly materialized and started to crawl towards this man. He was terrified, he lost his footing, and he fell from the roof. He was knocked unconscious and he was brought to a nearby hospital. When the man opened up his eyes in the hospital, he was terrified to see the vampire standing at the foot of his bed. Confused and terrified for his life, he jumped out of his room's window and fell to his death. Many believe that it is the vault itself that is the root of this story. It has iron gates that protects the doors, and due to this, many people think that they were put in place to keep the vampire in, versus its true purpose, to keep thrill-seekers out. Lore also tells about a big V-shape above the door that supposedly stands for vampire, but the truth is, it's actually the sculpture of a flower. The black stains on the vault that people claim are from the fire are actually from a number of environmental factors caused by atmospheric pollution and airborne soiling agents. But even so, the tale of this vampire is deeply embedded in local lore. Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. What are your thoughts on the tales of all these cemetery vampires? Why do you think that these tales are still being told today? Let us know your thoughts on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram and threads at Horrifying underscore History, or on X at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1. 
Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for our podcast. For when you do, not only do you let more people know about our show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, The Haunting of Fox Hollow Farm. If you would love to take home a piece of horrifying history, you really should check out our store. You'll find some great items by going to redbubble.com and by searching for horrifying history in their search box. And if you want to get a bunch of great perks like ad-free episodes, free merchandise, additional episodes, and much, much more, join our fan club on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash horrifyinghistory to sign up today. Thank you all for listening, and until next time.